Welcome to the Mets Pod presented by Tri State Cadillac. On today's show, the Mets are hot. They've won eight of their last 11 games. Joe and I break down the standout performances and Carlos Mendoza pressing all of the right buttons. We also go down on the farm to check on Nolan McLean, aka Cowboy Otani. We review our scoreboard predictions, make new ones, and of course, answer your mailbag questions. So subscribe to the Mets Pod at Apple Podcasts, Spotify. You can watch every episode and leave a question on SMY's YouTube channel or wherever you get your shows. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Mets Pod presented by Tri-State Cadillac. Elevate your style in a Cadillac. Go from bold to bolder in an SUV, from inspiring to awe-inspiring in a sedan. Visit your Tri-State Cadillac dealer today and subscribe to the Mets Pod at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your pods. If you'd like to drop us a review, drop us a mailbag question with that review. Watch us on YouTube and also ask mailbag questions in the comments under the show there as well. I'm your host, Connor Rogers, joined as always by my very optimistic, and he was right, co-host Joe DeMeo. Joe, the week that was right now, the Mets are hot. They've won series after series. More impressively, They've done it against some really, really good ball clubs. It just seems like everything has turned the corner for this team, Joe, after the 0-5 start. Winning is fun. I think we can certainly start with that. And right after we recorded last week's show, that's when the Mets did the 16-4 pounding of the Atlanta Braves. And that was just the start of, obviously, the last week of games where this team is showing some of that resilience that they had in 2022. They've come back from multiple deficits over the last week plus, including the win the win in Atlanta, and they had the comeback where they fell a little short in Atlanta as well. But this is looking like a team that just a couple of years ago, any lead, or I'm sorry, any deficit was not something that they were unable to overcome. So, you know, pretty exciting times in Mets land. Yeah, and I'll say, I'll say this. Uh, DJ Stewart will stand for no more slander from the Mets pod. Stewart has really, really picked it up. It feels like, Joe, the hits he's had have been some of the biggest hits on the season. It's not just the home run ball. Obviously, um, the pinch hit double against the Pirates as well. Stewart is a guy that, you know, you make this team. He's obviously somebody that's had a long road to the big leagues. He has a dreadful start to the season where it feels like he's striking out three out of every four or five at-bats. Mendoza sticks with him. And it feels like Joey's turned the corner when this team right now, as they wait longer than expected for J.D. Martinez to get here, they need some offensive production from, you know, I don't want to say unfamiliar places because Stewart had a really nice finish to the season last year, but I would say surprising places. And Stewart has finally found it after the slow start to the season. So far, so good. Like you said, Connor, after the slow start, this is the DJ Stewart that kind of went on that tear in August. You're seeing the same type of hitter here over the last few days. And with J.D. Martinez still a little behind, I believe he's going to uh, start swinging a bat here on Tuesday. So he's still working his way here. And he'll be here at some point. But while he is out, the Mets need to get production out of the designated hitter position. And DJ Stewart should be getting most of those at-bats, at least against the right-handed pitchers. And I think the most evident thing during that slow start with this team, Joe, was that the big bats, the boppers, the stars, the headlining names needed to start producing, or it just didn't matter. Nothing matters for this team if those guys don't start producing. And I think when you look at Nimmo really founded in Atlanta, then Lindor gets the ovation when they get back to city field which is a great idea pushed by steve cohen an even better job by the fans and lindor has looked a lot better since that moment and jeff mcneil has had some big hits as well we don't really have to go into it with pete alonzo because pete alonzo is always going to hit his home runs and then he goes and hits his home runs right you're going to get ebbs and flows of the season with young players like brett Beatty and francisco alvarez but i think we're happy with the early returns on those guys but those three that can be inconsistent at times, Nimmo, Lindor, and McNeil. It's no surprise, Joe, when at least two of the three are clicking, this offense is going to be fine, especially with the pitching the Mets have gotten 
uh, so far earlier in the season from some surprising faces. The offense is going to be fine. I know Francisco Lindor's you know, stat line, if you just go on baseball reference, is not something you really want to look at. But you're starting to see him make better contact, have better at-bats. He is historically a very slow starter. So this is not, I mean, it's a little extreme this year, but it's not crazy abnormal for Lindor to get off to a slow start at the beginning of a season. And, you know, big shout out to the Mets fans, because I know that was something that we had mentioned on this show a few weeks back trying to do the Alec Bohm thing that they did in Philly and Steve Trey Cohen, Turner. Yep. Yeah. And Trey Turner and Steve Cohen brought that to the forefront by, you know, posting on Twitter slash X about that. And, you know, shout out to the fans for actually going through with it because it would be very easy for that to be a Twitter thing. And then the fans in the ballpark are still booing. So, uh, good shout out to the fans for showing up and, and doing that for Lindor. And I think that's something that, there's so many added benefits to it, right? It not only gives the player a shot in the arm. I mean, Lindor almost hit the first pitch he saw after that 900 feet. He just pulled it foul. And we've seen much better at-bats from Lindor um, since then. And like you said, Joe, a lot of it is that he's just a slow starter and he's too good of a baseball player to not figure it out. But you want to make the Mets and City Field a franchise and an environment that players want to be at because this is a team that will be big players in the offseason next year. They might be a team that's involved at the deadline this year. They obviously feed off of it. I mean, we've seen the energy. I think Harrison Bader has been a big-time energy player. I think Tyrone Taylor has had some moments as well. Brett Beatty, I know you tweeted about this, Joe. The, the, the entire morale and everything around Brett Beatty feels like a 180 this year. And ever since that, home run early in the season against a lefty, but really just the fact you see his energy in the dugout, you see his energy on the base paths. This is what you get with a young team that's having some success, but also it feels like, and they're not the 2022 Mets, let's be fair. Do we think this team's winning 100 games? No, we've been very honest about that from the outset, but I think you're seeing the return of some of the energy that Bader has brought, the young players have brought, the pitchers have given them a chance with a couple of things. One, Edwin Diaz is back. That makes a big difference, a difference that is very hard to quantify. Two, it feels like Starling Marte is really, really back this year, energy-wise and as a player. So I think that, and you know what, Joe, you have to give credit to the manager and Carlos Mendoza that how you respond to adversity in professional sports, but of course in New York, it's even a little bit different says everything about you what a gut punch for mendoza out of the gate that this team starts zero and five and what a response morale wise not only from the manager but the trickle effect down to the team over these last 10 days massive for someone who's managing for the first time at the big league level like you said in new york and you know starting zero and five to start your managerial career it would be very easy for that to trickle the other way not the way that it has Will Salmon over at The Athletic wrote a great article about, you know, Mendoza and, and what he's doing in the clubhouse. And, you know, he said this at his introductory press conference as well. He said, we're going to be prepared, but we're going to have fun. That's what this is about. And that's something he said to DJ Stewart, who we were just talking about, who striking out seemingly every at bat in, in the very early going. And Mendoza just went up to him, patted him on the back and said, smile, have fun. And then... Stewart hits the home run in Atlanta, and as he comes back to the dugout, Mendoza slapped him on the rear end and said, smile. So sometimes it's there's a lot of things that we quantify, and we do a lot of that on this show, of breaking down the numbers and getting in the weeds. But sometimes baseball is about the unquantifiable, more so than almost any other sport. And Mendoza seems to have a fantastic pulse of the locker room and how to lead a group of men. And, of course, we are – 16 games into his managerial career and win loss record will ultimately determine how good or bad of a manager he is. But in the early going, this job in no way, shape or form seems too big for Carlos Mendoza. I would agree. And I think in a contrast to the energy of the dugout, which is often led by the position players, the pitching for this team has been fairly consistent out of the gate this year, considering the, adversity that they are facing their front man Kodai Senga was not ready out of the gate due to injury and it's going to be a while before we see Kodai Senga they were a little thin to begin with and we knew it would take an unlikely hero because 
you feel good about what you're going to get from Jose Quintana and Adrian Hauser. And I think even with Severino and Manaya, who have a little bit more variance, Severino, it's just make your starts. With Manaya, the stuff looks pretty good. And I know he had a rough start, but you still feel like Manaya can be that middle of the pack or back end starter. But this team really needed somebody to step up from an unlikely place, Joe. And that has been Jose Buto, who has a 0.75 ERA through two starts. He gets the quality start with six scoreless last week. This is someone who is building off of his success that he had at the end of last season and is proving, I belong here. Like, I'm going to do my job when I'm called upon. But you know, and Buto says all of the right things. It's really, really impressive. That's a tough spot to be in when you're the guy that's up and down and not pitching on a regular schedule. And let's not forget what Jose Buto, he's 26 years old. This isn't a 33-year-old that is, you know what, I've been in here before. I could do the spot starting type of thing. Buto is quickly writing his name in ink in this rotation, Joe, and has far and away been the best pitcher. Not only the two uh, two games where he has a .75 ERA and he's got 12 innings pitched across those two games, but striking out 11.3 over nine, his stuff looks excellent. Buto's been, you know, more than I think you could have potentially asked for from him. Of course, two starts, we'll, we'll go with the small sample thing, but the changeup, which has always been his plus pitch, was money in his last start against Kansas City. He had a 55% whiff rate on it, so Kansas City uh, hitters were just not picking it up. The fastball is up a couple ticks. He's touching 96 miles an hour. Uh, the slider is a pitch that he's been tinkering over the last year, two years, between a curveball and a slider and trying to find that right breaking ball that fits within his repertoire. And it seems like he's found a slider that's good enough. It's not a plus pitch but it's good enough to be used in game and, you know, shout out to him for, we talk about six man rotations and, and things like that on this show. Jose Budo's start against Kansas city was on 10 days rest. That is typically a recipe for a terrible start. And he was obviously fantastic striking out nine over six innings, getting that quality start. Uh, so Jose Budo, I think at this point, is a member of this Mets rotation until he's not. And when Tyler McGill returns from injury, uh, he's got to either find a spot in the bullpen or find a spot in the AAA rotation. And one shout out to the Mets here. Joe, you sent us in our Mets pod group text, the I like Budo and I cannot lie on the Mets gigantic scoreboard. Uh, having a lot of fun with it. And Buto has been absolutely killing it on the mound. Before we wrap up the week that was, got to give a little nod to the bullpen here, Joe. I, I bring up the constant, you know, surprise performances or a hero from an unfamiliar spot in Buto. It feels like that's almost the story of the Mets bullpen. And now, to be fair, Edwin Diaz, Drew Smith, Jorge Lopez, Adam Adovino, and Brooks Raley have been lights out. And those guys are the mainstays of the bullpen. They are what we like to call the high leverage guys. But Reed Garrett, three scoreless appearances right now. Tyler J, solid across two appearances, right? You're getting production from, you never want to say random players, but players that you don't hear a lot about before the season or going into the season. And of course, Joe, that's all you need is spotty production from those guys when the big five of the bullpen are truly dominant. I think at the end of the season, we need to do a Mets pod sporkle of the Mets 2024 roster because this is how you get through 162 games. As much as we spend months of the offseason and in spring training being like, this is the bullpen, this is the rotation, this is the lineup, the Mets are going to use like 50-something players this year probably to get through the season. That's pretty normal in a baseball season. So the Tyler Jays, and we will forget Julio Teron was ever a Met when we do this sporkle, and he will be a name that we just don't remember ever happened. Uh, one start and out. But the bullpen, Connor, has been, frankly, in a way, kind of what we expected. We thought the bullpen had a chance to be the strength of this roster. And right now, it is. Like you said, Edwin Diaz looks pretty much back to form. The velocity is not quite there. I'm not sure if he's holding back or if it's, you know, just it'll get warmer and he's just adjusting to being back in, in the flow of game. But I have no worries about anything Diaz is doing. Adam Adovino's stuff looks way better than it did last year. 
Brooks Raley just feels like old reliable. Like he's a guy we never, ever talk about. And he's he's been fantastic mm-hmm. since joining the Mets. And I think they have him under control for next year too. So uh, Brooks Raley, a very savvy trade that uh, the Mets made, you know, la- last off season. Yeah, they do. Uh, Raley, I believe is potentially under contract. We'll have to get into yeah, the, I think the, I, I think he has he's one got more arbitration. arbitration. He has one yeah. more arbitration year and then he's a free agent after that. So that's massive for a guy like really that it you know he's turning 36 in june man he's he's been unbelievable there's no way around it i mean one of the uh, you know looks like one of the better setup kind of guys and i know the fans have had an up and down relationship with drew smith but if drew smith can keep this going he's a really good you know 1b as a setup man Just have him well. in the middle of the game how good is that i mean yeah you're, you don't necessarily need to thrust him into the highest of leverage spots. You can have him in the middle of games. And Jorge Lopez, like you said, also has uh, stood out. And Jake Diekman's had a you know a bit up and down, but he's had a couple good outings too. So I feel fantastic about where the Mets bullpen's at. Lopez, the only performance that nearly gave us a heart attack was the Atlanta one, where every ball was hit 900 miles an hour, but when they're hit to gloves, nobody remembers it two days later. So you're listening to the Mets Pod presented by Tri-State Cadillac. Subscribe to the Mets Pod at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SNY's YouTube channel, or wherever you get your shows. All right, Joe, let's go down on the farm as we do. Nolan McClain, we are on this train. We are driving this train. Shout out to the Grateful Dead. Listen, Cowboy Otani, what a start to the year for the dual threat. He pitches, he hits 500 feet, uh, 500 foot home runs. And listen, Cowboy Otani. The origin story started on this show. Take a listen. I'm already giving him the nickname coming out of Oklahoma State. This is Cowboy Otani right here, uh, Nolan McLean. And what's pretty cool here for the Mets, a lot of people thought no matter where he got drafted, it would be, okay, time for you to focus on being a pitcher, probably a reliever. The Mets have been public that they are going to let him try to do both and maybe cut down on some of that massive swing and miss because the potential rewards in terms of how much raw power this guy has is worth trying that he we know is somebody that seems very interested in trying both there it is joe our reaction when the mets drafted out of oklahoma state nolan mcclain and he's been in brooklyn this year said some no doubter home runs he's pitching really well joe i know you've talked about the kind of stuff that he has what have you seen from mcclain down in brooklyn it's exciting that Noel McLean is actually getting to showcase the two-way ability because this is something the Mets said he was going to do after they drafted him. And he got a couple of bats in, in the complex league and he hit a home run there, but didn't hit as much there. Spring training, his hitting was like after workouts were done batting practice because as a pitcher and a hitter, believe it or not, those workouts happen at the same time because you need one to have the other. So it was tough for him to kind of pitch and then end up in the cage. So spring training pitching was clearly ahead of the offense, but now that they're in the rhythms of a season, he now has the opportunity to do a little bit of both. And the home runs, Connor, I mean, 108 off the bat, 112 off the bat. The second one at 112, he went down to a knee after he hit it. and it looked like a it. hockey slap shot. Yeah. He, <laughs> he had, he like a has, one-timer. He truly has raw power um, rivaling Ryan Clifford for the most just pure raw power in the system. And then on the mound, he could pump 98 with a wipeout sweeper and a developing changeup. So Nolan McLean, certainly a prospect to watch. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm interested to see his progression as a pitcher this year, as the Mets are stretching him as a starting pitcher, whereas at Oklahoma State, he was a reliever. And I want to see how the strikeout rate as a batter is because it was north of 40% in college. And that's obviously not a sustainable number at the professional level. Uh, But all in all, really awesome start for Cowboy Otani. Joe, I hate to put you on the spot like this, but this is what you do. What do you think there comes a crossroads with him where it's, you know, we've had a lot of fun with this and I hope the fun continues. And if he keeps hitting home runs and pitching like this, there won't be the crossroads. But if you had to make a prediction or at least set maybe percentages, what do you think the percentages are of him being a pitcher or a hitter? Is it like 70, 30 pitcher to hitter? I think the odds of him actually being a two-way player at the major league level is probably below 30%. I wouldn't put those odds 
particularly high. Pitching is definitely where he's ahead right now in in development. But if he keeps hitting, like you said, don't stop him until you got to stop him. There's no reason to pull the plug just to pull the plug. Uh, but I would expect the most likely home for Noel McLean as we progress forward and look ahead to the upper minors. I would think pitching would be the most likely scenario. Yeah, a really fun player to keep an eye on. Cowboy Otani. Uh, if you want to see the Cowboy in person, as well as other Cyclones, head out to Coney Island for schedule, tickets, and full details. Visit brooklyncyclones.com. And while we're down on the farm, if you want more minor league coverage, SNY's Danny Abriano got to speak to Christian Scott. So if you want more coverage there, go to sny.tv and make sure to check it out. All right, Joe, let's get into the scoreboard as we always do. Let's review our predictions from last week and head into a new week. A quick note here, it's ended up being six games instead of seven. Uh, like the Mets, our offense also broke out. Points galore here, Joe. Over under push was set at two for Pete Alonso home runs. Joe, you went with a push. I went with the over. Pete hit four. Four home runs in six games. I get the point. Over under push was set at one for Brett Beatty home runs. Joe, you went under. I went under. We each get a point. Over under push is set at five. Francisco Lindor hits. Joe, you went over. I went over. We both get a point. Lindor had seven hits. The We knew the uh, ovation would work. Over under push set at three for Mets stolen bases. Joe, you went with the push. I went with the over. They had five. I get another point. We, we're betting. Uh, we're, we're pretty hot this week. We were due for one like this. Over under push was set at nine. Mets stolen bases against. Joe, you went under. I went over. Only six bases stolen against the Mets. Good job, Joe. A point to you. Over under push was set at two. Mets starters going at least six innings. Joe, you went with the push. I went with the push. You only had one. This goes with the under. Butos six innings was the only start that had at least six innings across. No points awarded. The last one over under push was set at four for Mets wins. Joe, you went with the push. I went with the push. The Mets won four games. We each got a point. Massive week. Joe, you take home four points. I take home five. We are tied six to six on the season. Big matchup coming up this week. Six games, two against the Pirates, three against the Dodgers, one against the Giants. Joe, I will take the first one since I finally won a week, and boy, was I do, going back to last season. Over under push at two for DJ Stewart hits. Two hits in six games. I will actually push here, Joe. I'm not going to take the over. I think Stewart has had really big hits. I don't think he's had a lot of hits still. What do you like here? I should have looked at the pitching matchups to see how much DJ yeah. Stewart's going to play, but who needs that? You know what? I have, always, I have always been a big DJ Stewart stan, as everybody knows. So I'm going to go over DJ Stewart over two hits this week. All right, the next one, you take the floor for this. Brett Beatty home runs. The line is set at one. I'm going to keep riding the under on home runs for Brett. I like what he's doing at the plate. He's obviously getting clutch hits, and he's starting to hit the ball a little harder. But I, I'm not ready to, to go the home run route quite yet. Let's just keep the momentum going as it is. And as it warms up, I think the power will come. I'll push on this one as well. I think I like that Beatty's approach has been more put the ball in play, kind of spray the ball around the outfield. We always say, though, Joe, he's such a big, strong guy that there'll be times where the ball just naturally leaves the yard. So I still am not comfortable going over on this one, but I'll take one home run for the week. Over under pushes at six for Francisco Lindor hits. Lindor looks a lot better. He plays every single day. I think, though, Joe, I'll still go over under here Lindor we usually see the best of over summer and I agree with you I should check all the pitching matchups because if Lindor has two games where he's batting right-handed he will easily go over this but I'll go under for now I'll push I'll think it's I think things are trending in the right direction with Lindor I'm not ready to say this is necessarily going to be his breakout week where it's just like wow here is Francisco Lindor but I don't think it's going to be a, a struggle week for him so I'll say push all right, one another here. The Mets starters going at least six innings. Two is the number here. Joe, what do you like? I will go under. I think I think right now this rotation, for better or worse, is a lot of five, five and a third, five and two thirds, and then sprinkle in a six inninger. This is an easy under for me. The matchups are not easy. This rotation right now, 
building up throughout the season and just how they're built in general, they're not a rotation that has a lot of guys that go deep into games and they can get there. They need to prove that they could stay healthy. And Buto is a guy that, you know, needs to continue to stake his claim, but I'm with you, Joe, the matchups is what scares me on this one. Over under push is at three for Mets wins. Now go back to this. They got two more against the pirates. Really good team so far this year. Nice win by the Mets to kick off the we uh, the series three against the Dodgers, one against the giants. I'm going to push here. I think the Mets continue to hover around 500 for the week. What do you like? Yeah, I think right now this team is playing in a, in a lot of ways like a 500 team. Really, Which is okay. First, which is fine because we talk about this a lot, not to take this into the scoreboard uh, segment, but we talk about you know the playoff push and the race to the trade deadline, which ultimately is what a season is about nowadays, which Daniel Murphy told us on the show a few weeks back. But if you're 500... That puts you in playoff contention into the last week of the season. So I think they'll continue that kind of motion right now, and I'll push along with you. All right, a fun one to close it out. Over-under push is at one for Nolan McClain home runs. The Cyclones have six games until our next episode, Joe. I don't know how many games he's going to hit because it's it's not quite at the point right now where it's Otani level where – he pitches and then he hits every other day. It's kind of sprinkling in the at bat. So I'll say under on the home runs and I'll let you uh, take the positive side on Cowboy Otani. You know what? I'll, I'll take the push then just because this is my guy. I agree with you. It is a harder one to project because he is playing both ways and you just don't know how many at bats he'll get in a given week. But when he connects, the ball goes a mile. So let's go one home run for the Cowboy. All right, Joe, let's close out today's show with some mailbag questions. And of course, we got some great ones from YouTube. John Lyons asked, do you know if the Syracuse Mets are managing the innings pitched by prospects like Christian Scott, who could be called up this season, so that they'll be useful to the Mets and not burned out by September and maybe even October? How do, how do minor league teams manage this, Joe? I sure hope so. That would be what a player development system is really for. So it's more, <laughs> uh, you know, they, they set a plan for things. So it's not minor league inning usage and things like that. It's not like the major leagues where it's, you know, dictated by the manager of that given day. Obviously you have to operate within the confines. If a guy is getting shelled, you take him out early, et cetera, but they, they are planning out Christian Scott and Dom Hamill and Mike Vassell, who's off to a tough start, but th- those pitchers, the Mets have a plan for how they want to approach their innings. And Christian Scott is a guy that I, I think he's going to be up potentially sooner than a lot of people think. The next one here, sticking with the farm system, Oliver Gutierrez, 4055, asked, what's your feeling regarding Alex Ramirez? Is he having a good start compared to last year? Now, Joe, I haven't watched a Binghamton game yet. I've only seen highlights, but Ramirez, who is a 21-year-old in Binghamton right now, he's got an OPS of 994 in just eight games. Uh, 34 plate appearances, but he's hit a home run. He's stolen five bases. It on paper looks good, Joe. It's a small sample size. Has the has it looked as good in actual games? A lot better, a lot better than last year. You know, I was the high person, Alex Ramirez, not this past QBC, but the QBC before that. I think I'm on record saying I thought Ramirez was going to be a top 50 prospect in the sport. Obviously, last season did not go according to plan for him. Posted a a uh, sub 700 OPS repeating Brooklyn. I dropped them down to number 18 in my prospect rankings. There was just a lot of bad with what Alex Ramirez was doing last year. And I don't know if, what it was, but uh, a switch flipped with him, not just obviously in game with the stats that we have through, you know, almost two weeks of play in the off season, Alex Ramirez voluntarily on his own went to the Mets Academy in the Dominican five days a week to work on his swing mechanics because his swing would get really long at times, which made it very tough on velocity. And if he wasn't timing up a curveball, made it very difficult to make good contact on it, shortened his swing, which we saw in spring training in the select games that, you know, he got into that were on TV. I I believe Todd Zeal had done breakdowns and SNY of course has shown swing comparisons between last year and this year. It's a shorter swing. Still a strong kid, still a very toolsy kid. Um, In the early going, getting that jump to Binghamton off of struggling so badly in Brooklyn is a a very good sign if you're looking for a bounce back from a player uh, like Alex Ramirez. 
especially a guy that just has all the tools, Joe. I mean, a guy yep. that has those kind of tools, seeing it translate to some on paper production is a great sign. Hopefully you can keep it up. Let's move over to Twitter. This is from at Alvarez met for life. We agree with that handle with DJ. Uh, I think it's supposed to be healing up or tear. Oh, okay. Tearing up and JDM on the horizon. What are the plans for Mark Vientos? I feel like it is only a matter of time before he gets traded to a team that would actually use him. I, Joe, I just want to, before I even throw this to you, we, we, we talk about this a lot. I just don't understand the idea of trading Vientos because you don't have a place for him to play in the big leagues right now, because one, there's no return value right now, at least in my opinion. Two, J.D. Martinez isn't here because he had a back flare-up. J.D. Martinez has been awesome for the last couple of years, but his problems are when he does have struggles is from the back flaring up. D.J. Stewart, we don't know what D.J. Stewart is. We're happy that he turned around an awful start to the season. We're happy that he was a nice story at the end of last year. I hope he continues to be a piece. He's a guy that hits from the other side of the plate. So you still need... I just, Vientos, I get it. People either want to see him or they want to see him be successful somewhere else. I don't understand the constant demand and thought process of a guy that is going to be 24 years old this entire season. of just being like, well, we can't play him, so we can't, we can't keep him here. Guys get hurt all the time. The guy that is supposed to be taking Vientos' place is already hurt, and he hasn't played for the Mets yet. That's It's a little bit of me yelling at the sky, but... I, I just keep Vientos here and you will need him at some point this season. I uh, And David Stern said that at the outset of the season, inevitably we will see Mark Vientos with the Mets at some point. What if JD Martinez gets healthy now? All right. So let's say this back shot works. He's good. He comes back, but then he has another flare up and he has to go on the IL for a couple weeks and DJ Stewart pulls a hamstring. Who's your designated hitter? It's Tyrone you know, Taylor. Yeah, and at this point, it might be something where uh, it may meet, need a couple injuries or some underperformance from someone like DJ Stewart to necessitate a Mark Vientos call-up. But where we stand right now, Connor, I'm in lockstep with you that there's no rush to do something with Vientos. With that said, if you want to look long-term and think ahead, at some point you have to make a decision, is Mark Vientos a, a, a part of this team in the future? Or is he better suited being traded, even if the value isn't something fantastic, but just resetting with something else in your organization? I think that's a possibility. But where we stand today, um, I, I don't think the Mets should be in any rush to be moving on from Mark Vientos. And I suspect we will see him at some point. This one from Johnny. If Budo continues to earn his spot in the rotation and Scott continues to force his hand, which pitchers would hypothetically be in danger of losing their spots in the rotation when Senga is back and they're hope at hopefully full health? So, Joe, I feel like the answer to this is that they won't be at full health. Like that, the reality is whether it's Severino or an un, you know foreseen injury, that's how these chips kind of fall. But I do want you to kind of answer the question in the context of it being more difficult that everybody is healthy, not necessarily producing, but everybody's healthy. Yeah. In a perfect world, which we know does not exist. And these things a hundred percent of the time basically work themselves out and it all just falls into place. But if, if we're going to play in, you know, the, the perfect ideal world of everyone's healthy, everyone's fine. And Christian Scott is beating the heck out of AAA and you can't hold them down there anymore. I think the answer is you probably shift Adrian Hauser to the bullpen, I guess, or you shift Jose Buto to the bullpen. It's one of those two. And the Mets have been open that they're open-minded to having Buto be a, a long reliever. But I mean, if he's going to pitch to a, you know, two ERA or three ERA, then Jose Buto can't be taken out of the rotation. And uh, it, it would lead to some difficult discussions. And I do think that at some point here, uh, Christian Scott will force that issue one way or another. And it's just a matter of when that timing lines up, where are they at health wise? Where are they at performance wise? And uh, at that point, they'll they'll have to make that hard decision. All right, this one from Dean Julia. Can you talk to the difference in pitchers, ERA, and other stats while throwing to Alvarez and throwing to Narvaez? It's nice having Narvaez bat in there on Alvy's off days, 
but his glove and arm is a huge liability. So I actually don't have those stats. Maybe you could look them up, what the yeah. ERA with each one is. But what it comes down to, to me, is Alvarez is just a way better defensive catcher than Omar Narvaez is. And I hope the stats back that up. The pitch framing, the comfortability calling the game, his throwing arm is better. Even if the results of throwing out runner stealing hasn't been there, I don't think that is all on the catcher. It is some on the pitcher as well. But I think Alvarez is simply a better defensive catcher, and Narvaez is there for when Alvarez needs a day off. Narvaez goes in there, and um, unfortunately, it's been running all over Narvaez here in 2024. So it's uh, sometimes the life of a backup catcher. You have two choices with a backup catcher, right? You can choose an offense-first backup catcher, where maybe you're lacking some defensively, which is Narvaez is what how I would describe him. Or you can have, you know, the other side of the coin, a Tomas Nito type, where it's a very good defensive catcher that can throw, but you're expecting just basically nothing offensively. Right. That's that's the tricky part in this, and that it feels like the Mets obviously value Narvaez bringing some offense, especially when they're waiting for JD to get up here. They know that, you know, guys like Bader and Taylor and Stewart have had some really big moments. I don't think Bader and Taylor are here for their defense. Like if they go into slumps, I'm not going to be angry that those guys are slumping because they're defensive players. It's nice that they're giving them a little punch on offense right now. So it's about, you know, filling out your deficiencies. I do think the eye test tells you that there's a big difference, right? And you hope Alvarez is, you know, that kind of horse that could play a lot. And but you're right, Joe, it makes you wonder, is this a team? Do they reach a point where they're starting to really hum offensively? Say Martinez is here. The guys in the one through four spot are hitting. McNeil is finding it. Let's not say McNeil's batting title McNeil, but McNeil's hitting 280. Marte's having his moments where you look at it and go, I'm not saying they're going to cut Narvaez. We're not even close to that right now. But at what point do you try to – this is a roster that carried both Joey Wendell and Zach Shore almost to do the same thing. Do you start to look at it and go, hey, these two weeks we're going to carry a third catcher because we need to keep Alvarez off his feet at times in July. This is a long season. But to close out games, we might need a defensive replacement catcher, not an offensive replacement catcher. So it's just roster management, and it's it's really, really tricky, and it's – um. It's something that, once again, like this is an April conversation. If Narvaez is out there and there is just this stark difference in everything from a pitching to defense metric that is losing you games, then the Mets will probably have to have a tough conversation, I would think. Yeah, at some point it it, it would come down to that. And, you know, obviously we don't want to put the, the cart ahead of the horse here, but if this is a problem into the summer – then you know maybe you do eat some money on Narvaez and and make a move there and call up more of a defensive type catcher or like you said Connor if if it works out situationally where you could temporarily carry three catchers you could also go that route but for now I think it's Alvarez is playing most of the time as a young catcher and Narvaez is just simply spelling him on occasion. This is the Mets pod presented by Tri-State Cadillac. Elevate your style in a Cadillac. Go from bold to bolder in an SUV, from inspiring to awe-inspiring in a sedan. Visit your Tri-State Cadillac dealer today. And remember to subscribe to the show, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. Leave us a review with a question and we'll look for it and use it in a future mailbag. And of course, you can watch every episode on SNY's YouTube channel. Please become a subscriber over there as well. Let's keep the good times rolling. The Mets are back to 500. We'll catch you next week.